Thank you. So again, my name is Brian Crever. I am the environmental coordinator um, for New York for a few more days while uh, the regular environmental co coordinator gets back from her honeymoon. So, um, <laughs> but uh, you're in good hands for today. I'm the environmental coordinator for Massachusetts, uh, North Carolina, and South Carolina. So I've been here before. Yeah, it's true, it's kind of a midpoint. So um, we're here to talk about the New York Environmental Assessment, uh, and that's for commercial wind lease issuance and site assessment activities offshore of New York. So um, the New York Environmental Assessment, uh, you can find it in, on our website. You can also uh, search for it with our docket number, which is BOEM-2016-0038. And uh, it was published on June 6th, and it's open right now for a 30-day public comment period which closes on July 6th. So what is the National Environmental Policy Act? You, might heard, you may have heard this be called NEPA. Um, actually, my name tag it says NEPA coordinator. Uh, that's primarily what I do is coordinate the development of these documents. So uh, the National Environmental Policy Act is a procedural law uh, that requires federal agencies to assess the environmental effects of their proposed actions and also come up with reasonable alternatives uh, prior to decision making. So it's primarily to inform our decision makers of the, the environmental impacts and the socioeconomic impacts of our actions. And one thing to note is that it's uh, the National Environmental Policy Act, not the National Environmental Protection Act. So impacts can happen um, from federal government actions, as, as I'm sure you all know. But really what this law is meant to do is to make federal officials aware of, the, of those impacts before they make their decisions. So speaking of decisions and major actions, uh, these are some of the major actions. It might be a little hard to see in the back, um, but some of the major actions and decision points uh, where we do kind of our, our NEPA process. So it's lease issuance, uh, survey work, what we're kind of looking at now. Also uh, plan approval, so the approval of a site assessment plan or the approval of a construction and operations plan. Uh, also decommissioning activities. We would want to uh, do analysis on that to know the impacts. And this is just a quick overview of our standard uh, NEPA process. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but I'll just point out um, that we do our environmental consultations uh, concurrently with the environmental assessment, um, both uh, to inform our environmental assessment, but also to uh, have some efficiency in the process. So what is an environmental assessment? Uh, it's a concise public document uh, that briefly uh, provides sufficient evidence and analysis for determining whether we need to prepare an environmental impact statement, which is a much larger document. Uh, and it aids our compliancy with the National Environmental Policy Act when an EIS is not necessary. So that helps us come up with better alternatives to our proposed action. It also helps us come up with mitigation measures uh, if, if we find any impacts. And in the case that we did find significant impacts uh, through the development of our, our environmental assessment, the actual environmental assessment document would be a great baseline uh, for our pre preparation of an environmental impact statement. So what are we considering as part of our proposed action for this project? Um, we're only considering lease issuance and the reasonably foreseeable consequences of issuing that lease. And for that, it would be uh, site characterization activities or surveys. In the middle, you can see a, a survey vessel. It's one of the vessels that, a type of vessel that might be doing surveys off of New York, um, looking at kind of the bottom of the ocean, seeing if there are hazards down there, characterizing it to see if it'd be a suitable place to install uh, offshore wind. Also, um, subsequent site assessment activities. As Aaron said, um, one of the things developers really want to find out is uh, how, what the wind speed is like out there offshore in New York. Um, there is model data that they have, but they don't necessarily have uh, real-time uh, consistent wind data, and it's really important to know. Also, wave data, um, knowing what the waves are like out there is very important um, when designing what kind of wind turbine you want to put out there. And so what are we not considering as part of this environmental assessment? Right now, we're not considering the, considering the installation, operation, and decommissioning of a commercial scale wind energy facility. Uh, if an eventual leasee were to submit an actual construction and operations plan, then we would do a site-specific environmental analysis on that plan, and it will likely take the form of an environmental impact statement. So under the National Environmental Policy Act, you're required to look at alternatives. And for this particular, uh, environmental assessment, we looked at uh, two alternatives. One we call alternative B, which is the, leasing the entire wind energy area, but restricting site assessment structure placement within two nautical miles of the traffic separation scheme. Um, right now, there's a one nautical mile no build zone. Um, we've had recommendations from the Coast Guard and the maritime community to ex extend that to two nautical miles. 
Um, so we looked at that in our environmental assessment. We also uh, look at a no action alternative, which is required under the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, other alternatives were suggested to us during, um, during our various comment periods and during our stakeholder outreach, um, but these were not analyzed in the environmental assessment as they did not meet the purpose and need or they were not reasonable. Um, I, these are actually very interesting um, and I would suggest everyone read about them because it might affect a resource that, that you're interested in. You might be wondering why we didn't consider it as an alternative or analyze it as an alternative. And I just want you guys to know that we do, we do think about these things and we give them a hard look. Um, and that's in section 2.4 of, of the environmental assessment. So one of the things, first things we do when we're developing our environmental assessment is we look at the impact producing factors or what things, what aspects of our action could cause impacts to the environment or to the human environment. Um, and those are vessel traffic, um, noise from pile driving and noise from surveys, so underwater noise, also uh, vessel, vessel collisions or elisions. Nobody in the Coast Guard is here to tell me if I'm wrong on this, but elisions are when a vessel hits a fixed structure. So we hope that doesn't happen, but that's what that means. Uh, also bottom disturbing activities, so not just from pile driving, but also from anchoring of ships or anchoring of a buoy. And emissions and discharges, lighting and visual and aesthetic interference. This is just a, um, this is a, a pretty big list, but it's not all the resources we cover. Um, but it, it does show that we cover physical, biological, and socioeconomic issues. So not just impacts to marine mammals and sea turtles, but also impacts to the fishing community, to cultural resources, tourism and recreation, things of that nature. So this is a, a pretty important slide. Uh, it's talking about our environmental lease stipulations. And these are some standard operating conditions that were developed uh, through our consultations uh, with various resource agencies, including NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service, um, and the Fish and Wildlife Service. And so they take various forms and we enforce these through uh, Addendum C in our leases as environmental lease stipulations. And you can find them in Appendix B of the EA. And so they're basically developed to reduce or eliminate environmental risk. So anything you do offshore um, in an environment with protected species uh, carries some risk, even if you're trying to do a project like a renewable energy project. So what we do is we try to lessen the risk through these stipulations. and we have things like um, pre-survey coordination. So before a developer were to go out and, and do their actual surveys, they have to submit their plans to us and we analyze those to make sure they're actually going to get a quality information through their surveys that, that we're required um, to look at before we approve it. So if they're not gonna give us uh, information detailed enough on, on the bottom of the ocean and we might not be able to tell if there's an archeological site down there, we'd have to have them go back and and give us more information. We don't want them to have to do surveys twice, so we have these pre-survey coordination to try to get on the same page and ensure quality data. We also have vessel strike avoidance measures. Um, we take our protection of marine mammals very seriously and protected species, and so these are designed to avoid those kind of impacts. So um, you have vessel speed restrictions in this. You also have um, buffer zones so, and marine mammal observers. So when a ship's underway, marine mammal observers and protected species observers are out there looking for um, protected species, and if they get inside the buffer, you stop ship operations. Also, um, archeological survey requirements and discovery clauses, and HRG and geotechnical survey requirements. This includes electronic uh, ramp up, so the survey vessels don't immediately turn on their electronic equipment. Um, that would instantly create the loudest um, noise that the equipment would use. So instead, they slowly ramp it up, slowly increasing the noise so that if there was um, any species in the region, but specifically protected species, they would have an opportunity to move out of the way and wouldn't be exposed to the greatest sounds. Um, we also, um, high resolution geophysical surveys. Um, we, unfortunately, we don't have our geophysicist here tonight. She would love to talk about that all night, but um, that's, so there, there's just different kinds of surveys uh, that, uh, that characterize the bottom. Uh, our, one of our, um, Marine biologist is here, so if you want more specifics on that, she can describe in, in more detail the surveys. So Desiree Reeves, she'll be in the back of the room with the protected species posters later. And finally, uh, reporting requirements. So um, requirements that are, these are usually imposed by NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service, and it requires uh, any uh, vessel operator when underway, if they see a protected species to report that, if they see an injured protected species to report that, or if they were to uh, happen to injure a protected species, all that things require 
that they're required to report it to us and within a certain time frame. So um, these are all the environmental lease stipulations. And if you want to get more, more information on them, they're in addendum C in the PSN and then appendix B of the EA. So the findings of the environmental assessment. For most resources, uh, reasonably foreseeable impacts were found to be negligible to minor. Um, there were potential moderate impacts identified from marine mammals and sea turtles. This was only the result of noise related to pile driving uh, from the uh, construction of our meteorological tower. Um, we do feel that our standard operating conditions um, would minimize or eliminate these potential impacts. Um, so in conclusion, oh, we did not find any reasonably foreseeable significant impacts as a result of the proposed action. Um, but we, the EA has not been finalized as of now. We haven't issued a finding of no significant impact. So um, if we do find significant impacts, um, that, that could change. Um, and so concurrently with the EA, as I stated, we do consultations and we do them for the National Historic Preservation Act, the Coastal Zone Management Act um, for both New York and New Jersey as both of them are affected states. Also in the Endangered Species Act and Magnus and Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act or Essential Fish Habitat. So what are the next steps for the environmental assessment? Uh, right now we're in our 30 day public comment period, which ends on July 6th. So we're gonna get all the comments we receive and um, we're gonna conclude our consultations and we're gonna review all the, consulta the, all the comments received and we're either going to revise the EA and or issue a finding of no significant impact or if we find significant impacts, then we'll start preparing an environmental impact statement. So uh, here's my contact information. Uh, I've got my email address and my phone number. So feel free to give me a call and um, I'll answer your question or ISIS might uh, Mrs. Johnson is the regular NEPA coordinator. She might take it away from me and then I, I'll pass it on to her. Um, but then, uh, so that's my contact information. And then this is how to comment on the environmental assessment. Um, so I'll leave this up here for you guys to look at. <laughs>